these kind of big build-ups are always a little dangerous, you know, because um, uh, I, I remember, you know, going to an event um, in, in Budapest earlier this year, and a few days before going, I had an article about some of my, my work in the Financial Times, and I guess most of you know the Financial Times, and the article referred to me as a management guru. So now, of course, I got on the phone to my mum in Shepparton, Australia, a little country town up in the bush, and I called her and said, Mum, I've become a guru, which made me laugh this morning when I was listening to John Hunter because my mum had almost the same reaction. She said, Jamie, that's wonderful, but when are you going to get a real job? Because I've always been an academic, she doesn't quite understand that. Um, but actually, the worst part of it was about two weeks later, I went to an event, and this was the event in Budapest, and I, I arrived the night before, and, and there I was, you know, in the gym working out the night before, um, coming up in the elevator, and I was looking pretty disheveled and sweaty and having my bike shorts. And as I got to the first floor, a couple of ladies got in, got in quite tall, and they started to talk. And, I, I didn't quite follow, you know, what they were saying. I think they were speaking Hungarian or, or something like that. But I did hear the words guru and Jamie Anderson. <laughs> so, you know, I smiled and kind of stepped forward. And I said, well, actually, that's me. And these two ladies looked me up and down, you know. And there was silence until the elevator doors opened. And as the two of them stepped out, one of them turned to me and said, Yes, and I am Lady Gaga. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I, maybe they're expecting a guy with gray hair or something. And Yeah, so, but uh, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, I'm going to mention in a moment what I'm going to talk about. And, and actually, what I'm, what I'm here to talk about is, is not what I thought I was going to talk about when I was invited to TED. Because when I was invited here, I thought, I want to talk about something new. And therefore, I'm going to talk about this topic called social media. I think everyone knows what social media is, Twitter and Facebook and so on, but I was going to come and talk about social media. But the more I got into this topic of social media and the more I spoke to experts and read papers and attended conferences, I started to actually appreciate that, that, that we've got it wrong on social media. And in fact, you know, I, I've heard a lot of experts advising individuals and uh, organizations on a social media strategy or plan. And these experts talk about social media like it's something that you do to people. It's something that you do to people. But of course, you know, as we know, social media is actually about relationships. And you know, relationships are never something that you do to someone. Relationships are things that you do with someone or with other people. So I started to think about that, and in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, a revelation came to me, and I really discovered and, and revealed to myself that it's not about social media. It's actually about something a bit more profound than that. And the term that I like to use is actually followership. And as you'll see from my talk in a moment, what I'm going to talk about today is this concept of followership. What struck me as I started to get into this topic was that actually not a lot has been said about it. A lot about leadership, you know, the authentic leader and projecting yourself and situational leaders, but very little has been said about the follower. So here goes the title of my talk. Um, and as you'll see, I'm going to talk about some interesting people. Um, and this is where I'm going to start, actually. I'm going to start with two people. And what I'm going to suggest is that these two people tell us an awful lot about this thing called followership. I'm going to go also to talk about some other folks along the way. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, of course, all of you know him, born in, born in uh, uh, Purbanda in India in 1869. A long line of, of bureaucrats that are in his family, but he decided to make a break with tradition and go to England to study the law, against the advice of the headman of, of his community. He spent some years in England, then he went back to India to a predictable life of, of, of being a, provisional, a provincial lawyer. But that didn't happen because he had the opportunity to go to South Africa to defend a law case. Now, he spent 20 years in South Africa, and during that time, he really developed his philosophy of humanism. And that's a philosophy that I'm going to, I'm going to talk about as we go along. Um, the other lady, I think most of you know, but who knew her just three years ago? Almost none of us. Let's have a look at her for a moment.
Roma, Roma, ma, già, già, urtolo. A nata no a lui rea io stai. Okay, 13, 13 million albums sold, 51 million singles at a time of global piracy in the music industry. Born as a four-year, she started to play the piano at the age of four. She wrote her first song at the age of 13. Um, she grew up in a, in a privileged New York family, went to a very expensive private school, but she never fitted in. She was different. She was a misfit. She was this round peg in a square hole. Now, how do I know this? Because she told me. And one of the building blocks of followership is to tell people who you are. And she does that oh so well. By the way, you know she's always been a star, don't you? She's told us that. The world's just starting to discover that. Now, what about this? Huh? Is this... Is this Lady Gaga, of course it is. In interviews with journalists, they always ask her, we want to see the real you. This is who she is. She's always loved to dress up. And she will say to her fans, you will never see me in track pants because I was born this way. Costume, is it important for other people? Absolutely. Okay, the costumes are a little bit different, <laughs> but they're having something to say. Eh? Mahatma Gandhi, he took the life of an ascetic because he said you have to embody your message. Did he always look this way? Absolutely not. Huh? A young, proud lawyer, but that wasn't who he was. He developed this story of humanism, and he understood that he had to be something very, very difficult for his followers. This is who he became. And he wore that same costume, whether he was talking to kings or whether he was talking to the humble people in rural villages of India. Now, I told you I'm going to move away a little bit from this world of politics or social issues and, and music to the business world. What about this gentleman? You know, this guy, an adoptee, an iconic technology CEO, a Buddhist, and just like John Hunter, this is starting to get stranger, huh? he went off to India in the 1970s. He didn't come back with an afro, he came back with a shaved head. And then he became the CEO of Apple. He started a technology company. But was this Steve Jobs, people? No, this was the image that the, the investment analysts wanted him to project when he was going to take his company to the public markets. And actually... He moved back. This is Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs, this is the uniform that he projects. Who are Steve Jobs' followers? They're programmers, they're employees, they're customers. Has he adapted that costume? No. <laughs> Just like Mahatma Gandhi, folks, he knows who he is and he projects that image. So the first message of this story is if you want followers, you have to tell them who you are. And that's all about what you stand for and where you come from. But it's not enough. You also need to some, say something about the collective, the community. Now, you see these girls? These are little monsters. Lady Gaga says, you and I, you're, you're my little monsters. We are in it together. You see the paws up? That's the collective sign to say that we're part of the community. Lady Gaga says it's okay not to fit in. That's what attracts gay, lesbian, teenage fans to her. Now, by the way, I think the lady on the right... The hair star came from killing her 15-year-old cat, which I wasn't going to mention. Okay, but people, they're passionate about this, okay? And they want to be part of something. She helps them do that. Now, by the way, she also thanks her fans continuously, saying, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you. People want significance, and they want to be part of your journey. Now, what about Apple people? You know, I recently got a MacBook Air, and I was on a flight to Zurich, and I was sitting there working before the flight took off, and a middle-aged man walked past, and he looked at me and gave me this strange smile. Now, I thought this was a little bit weird, when men smile at you on a flight. But anyway, I walked down the aisle to go to the restroom halfway through the flight, and what did I see? He had one too! And I knew at that moment I've become one of them. You see? Now, what is one of them? This is one of them. Who is an Apple person? Just two words, think differently. That's who we are. Steve Jobs always talked about his difference, about dropping out of university to pursue his passions. Just like Lady Gaga, you don't have to fit in to be an Apple person. And that's become a global mantra 
for the people who see themselves as Apple people. But equally, Mahatma Gandhi, he never spoke of his journey as walking alone. He had a philosophy of Satyagraha, which was the, the humanism and the peaceful resistance of tyranny, of racism, of colonialism. And he said to his followers that I cannot do this alone. If I am beaten down or imprisoned, you have to continue. And in fact, over time, his followers came to call themselves Satyagrahis, the followers of, of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, two of those Satyagrahis went on to do very important things in their own lives. Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King. Satyagrahis. The collective. So when we talk about this story of followership, it's not just about who I am, but we have to give people a sense of community, a sense of belonging. And that is very much about who are we. Who are we together as a meaningful community? Now, there is another dimension. And that dimension is all about the future. Because people want electrifying moments. They want to know where they are going in the world. And what we saw with Gandhi is he was always pointing the way to the future. And he was encouraging his followers to come along with him. And he said to them that you must be the change that you wish to see in the world. And it was about accountability and taking an ownership of that future. But, you know, future vision is not just for people like Gandhi. It's also for people like Lady Gaga and Steve Jobs. Lady Gaga says no one has, invent, has reinvented music since Madonna did it 25 years ago. But in fact, she said it's not about music anymore. The old idea of music being a, a four-minute groove on a vinyl, that, that's not what it's about anymore. Music is an art form, as we've seen here at TED today. And she says that we are artists. And by the way, she says that all of us are superstars. Of course we are. Wherever you're sitting in this auditorium, you're all superstars. And she communicates that to her followers. Steve Jobs, he talks about the future, but he talks about the future of technology. You know, he talks about humanity and how technology can enhance humanity, how it can connect people together. And every year, when he stands up at the Macworld conference, he evangelizes to people about this future of the world, of technology. So it's not enough just for people to know who you are. That's important. It's not enough for you just to share with them a sense of shared values or identity or belonging. It's also critical for you to give people that sense of direction, of vision, and make that electrifying, make it exciting. So there's the third component, and that's all about where are we going. Now, what, can I ask you to promise me something? You know, I've met a lot of people here today. I've gone around, and I've shaken hands, and I've talked to people. Can I ask you to promise me something? Right, okay. I'm going to walk off the stage in a moment, and when I walk off the stage, what I want you to do is look in the eyes of the person next to you. You can hug them, you can shake their hand, you can do what you want. But what is TED about? TED is about making a difference. And we have a responsibility. And what I want you to ask the person next to you is, why should I follow you? You don't have to do it yet. But that's the question I want. Because you know what? Followership... Followership is not just about people like this. Mahatma Gandhi, oh, the scary thing about this photo is that Steve Jobs is starting to look remarkably like Gandhi. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's not just about people like this. It's about people like us. Now, you know, I, when I walked around today, I met amazing people. I met, is Sophie here? I met Sophie Klaas, who is one of Belgium's most outstanding up-and-coming young fashion designers. I asked her, Sophie, why should anyone follow you? I met a young guy, Frederick de Wilde, who's, who's also an incredible young creative talent and artist here in Belgium. I asked him the same question. And Sophie and Frederick and all of you, you need to be able to answer that question. Thank you. <laughs>